So we will go really deep down in fundamental experiments and I will focus mainly on what I'm interested in which is metastatic leishmaniasis. But before, and this is what I will mention, it's infection in the foot pad and dissemination you can see here in the snout and in the, this is uh, back foot pad and the, on the forehand foot pad that you can see dissemination. So briefly, innate immunity and it's going to be ma the main topic of my talk. Innate immunity is very important in the very quick response. It occurs very quickly and uh, it con can control the, inf the infection mainly through inflammation and it uses a series of uh, receptors uh, which are common for all the pathogens. Then you have recruitment and you have the adaptive immunity and you have recruitment of D and B cells and then it starts to be specific for the pathogen. So you have some kind of instructions. So here you have, for example, a pathogen goes through the skin or mucosa. Then uh, it can be sensed by specific pattern recognition receptor. You can have inflammation, instruction of T and B cells and then regulation of the immune response. So you can divide in between innate and acquired immunity. In the innate immunity, if you have different type of signals, and the signals can be danger signals, or so it can be pathogens, so chemicals, virus, bacteria, and parasites. And they can act through ma four main type of uh, pattern recognition receptors, PRR. And you can divide them between node-like receptors, which are which are recognized and stimulated by chemicals, UV, autophagy, for example. DNA sensors, which are mainly cytoplasmic DNA, or which recognize cytoplasmic DNA or single-stranded RNA or double-stranded RNA inside the cell. You have toll-like receptors that I will talk about mainly uh, later on, which uh, recognize LPS, for example, like toll-like receptor 4. And then you have a series of C-type lectin receptors, CLRs, which recognize carbohydrate and like mannose receptor, dectin, and a new one in DC, which is called Minkel. Then you can have secretion and inhibition of inflammatory cytokines and chemokines, and you can have acute inflammation and if it's not controlled then you end up with a chronic inflammation. So you have some aspect which are important is to how to resolve the inflammation. So my talk will mainly deal with toll-like receptor and in the toll-like receptor you have two types. You have surface toll-like receptors and endosomal TLRs. So surface receptors they recognize specific lipopeptide for example and that's the case for TLR2 and TLR6, which is a triacyl lipopeptide, or TLR2, TLR1, diacyl lipopeptide. And you have another one, which was already mentioned today, which is uh, TLR4, which, is recog which recognizes LPS. And then you have uh, production of interferon, password, interferon in inflammatory cytokines. Then you have the endosomal TLRs. The endosomal TLRs, you find them in the endosomes, as the name indicates. They sense nucleic acids, and among the different nucleic acids, you have different TLRs. If it's double-stranded RNA, which is very specific, recog specifically recognized by TLR3, whereas single-stranded RNA uh, is recognized by TLR7, TLR8. CPG, which was used uh, in vaccine, and it's often used as an adjuvant, is recognized by TLR9. And then through specific adapter molecules, you have also production of interferon, type 1 interferon, uh, type 1 interferon, and inflammatory cytokines. So that was a brief introduction to just to go to Leishmania, Leishmania and TLRs. So most of the TLRs are protective against Leishmania. If you, if this has been done through a series of knockout mice. And it was shown that TLR2, 4, and 9 mainly protect against leishmaniasis. So they do, their, they do what they have to do. And the protection via the TLRs is mainly due to inflammation and production of specific uh, chemokine, inflammatory chemokine and cytokines, like TNF-alpha, interleukin-1-beta, and so on. They could be cross-talk between the TLRs. So you can activate TLR2 and TLR9, TLR2 and TLR3, and so on which complicates really the picture. And uh, so you can have, for example, TLR7 could inhibit 2, 4, and 9, depending on the timing. TLR3 can synergize with TLR2 and TLR9. 
I think there is a lot of study you have to be extremely careful because uh, you can have LPS in your study and then you can activate TLR4. So people, when you do studies with uh, activation of TLR, be careful if you have LPS, use plastic and so on, and also mycoplasma. So be ca extremely careful in your study with the TLR. And we were fooled once with uh, some LPS in a glass bottle, so I know exactly how it can go. Anyway, so now here is a summary of uh, some examples of Leishmania and TLRs. For example, TLR2, it's protective, down-regulates Leishmania killing, uh, and you can have small difference between the different Leishmania species. For example, LPG in Leishmania major with TLR2 is protective. It's also protective with Leishmania mexicana. There are questions about the role of LPG in the last paper. And uh, in uh, Leishmania donovani, it down-regulates Leishmania killing. So you have a series of uh, action of the different TLRs, and it can vary slightly from one Leishmania species to another Leishmania species. And it depends on the level of expression of LPG you can have. It can depend on the level, for example, of this P8 proteoglycan, which is expressed on Pifanoid. The one which is pretty well characterized, which is, which is toll-like receptor 3 now, which is due to the activation of a specific virus present in Leishmania species, which is a Leishmania double-stranded RNA virus. And in this case, instead of protecting against Leishmania, it increases the severity of the disease. And this is uh, what we are doing and what I will talk about. So if we take the different Leishmania species, as you know, you have different types of pathologies. You have cutaneous Leishmania species, uh, on one side of the spectrum, and you have visceral leishmaniasis uh, on the other side of the spectrum. And uh, here, cutaneous is induced by major Brazilianzis and so on, and Guayanensis. Here, you have Infantum and Donovani. In the middle, you have what we, called, uh, we call the metastatic leishmaniasis, because what you have after a primary lesion, you can end up with mucosal uh, lesions or disseminated lesions in the skin. And uh, these disease, uh, this type of leishmaniasis, they are induced, they are caused by parasites like Brazilianzis and Guayanensis, the same type of parasite which can induce cutaneous leishmaniasis. What you observe in this kind of pathologies is really the presence of inflammatory chemokines and cytokines. So you have really an induction of the inflammation. And uh, we showed that some of these uh, strains, like Leishmania guayanensis, carries a virus, an endosymbiont, which is called Leishmania RNA virus, which is LR. And you have here, you have simple ways of detecting this uh, virus using uh, an antibody against double-stranded RNA. And we have isogenic strains, which are either LRV plus or V plus versus strains which are V minus. What are these viruses? It's like the yeast killer virus, and we already had a talk this morning, a short talk on LRV. Uh, this uh, totivirus, this totiviridae, totivirus is in yeast, tot this totiviridae, they have a capsid. It's around probably, we don't know for Leishmania if it's really uh, the same kind of organization than the killer virus. It's around 120 subunits per capsid, one single double-stranded RNA molecule which binds to, to toll like receptor 3, and maybe one or two uh, RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. In Leishmania, it's cytosolic, it's not shedded, it's not infectious. There is one case for in Jardia where you can reinfect the Jardia virus negative with uh, some Jardia virus, but it's not the case for Leishmania. So you find this type of virus in several protozoan parasites, and uh, I don't want to go through the whole list, but among these different uh, pathogens, different protons and parasites, are for two of them where there is an increase in virulence. It has been shown for trichomonas and uh, in Leishmania. And also, and I will talk mainly about that tomorrow, uh, it can play a role in drug escape or drug resistance. So in which species do you find the Leishmania RNA virus? It has been initially described in uh, Brazilianzis and Guayanensis, and uh, with one report in Leishmania Major. 
Now there is one isolate, uh, there is a second isolate in Leishmania Major. So there are two isolates in Leishmania Major uh, of this LRV. There is one report of Leishmania of a presence of LRV in one case of Leishmania Infantum, isolated from a child in Iran. And we reported the presence of uh, LRV in Leishmania Ethiopica. Even if uh, so far there is no report of uh, LRV in Leishmania panamensis, uh, we don't know if it's because we didn't get the right isolate, but so far you can have mucosal or mucocutaneous leishmaniasis without the presence of LRV. And that uh, will maybe explain why some, in some cases. The classification of this virus, you can divide it between old world and new world. In the old world, it's called LRV2, so it's major in phantom, mainly at Yopica. These are rare cases, but it's more prevalent in uh, new world species, in Leishmania viana, where you find it in Brazilianzis and Guayanensis. And you, I bet, and I know, that there are more species which carry LRV, uh, but they are not published yet. Um, when you have LRV in Leishmania guayanensis, what happens is you have an increase in the inflammation. So we showed some years ago uh, that you have an increase in production of interferon beta and cytokine and chemo inflammatory cytokines and chemokines, which are upregulated when LRV is present in Leishmania guayanensis. This has a strong effect on food pad levels. So if you see here, you have wild type mice infected with V plus, and if you remove toll-like receptor 3, you have a decrease in the size of the lesion. So clearly, luckily, we were working with toll-like receptor 3, and toll-like receptor 3 is recognized by double-stranded RNA. There are no other type of agonists. So I think we were lucky, because otherwise, with a toll -like, another toll-like receptor, it would have been more complicated. You have no difference if the virus is not present in Leishmania. You have no difference in the footpad size. Similarly, uh, no, in addition, you can see that it has an effect not only on foot pad size, which would be a mark, a proxy of an inflammation, but you have a decrease in the number of parasites in the foot pad. So now, Leishmania guayanensis and Brazilianzis have, in comparison to the, older to the old world Leishmania, they carry the RNA machinery. So recently, Steve Beverly showed that you can knock down this parasite. So that was a discussion this morning. How can we have some an isogenic line uh, in Brazilianzis? Uh, this, this is done, and it just has been published. And uh, so what is done is you use this kind of stem loop structure. You introduce your gene of interest in the form of a stem loop. And they introduce either the capsid, capsid sequences, or the polymerase sequences and different fragments of the capsid, or different fragment sequences of the polymerase in this region. And this activates the RNA I machinery of the cell. So Leishmania viana is, is specific, I mean, still keeps this, all this machinery. So that makes that if you reintroduce this construct, and you can integrate them through homolog recombination here. What happens, you can decrease the number of transcripts. So you have here wild type, and this is a control where the RNAi was directed against a GFP. And uh, you can measure then the level of the amount of LRV1 or LRV in these different cells. So you have here RNAi against the, the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase or against a capsid, this has been done for Brazilianzis. So you can see that compared to the wild type level, you can decrease the, number, the amount of LRV in this sequence to a, to a zero level almost. <coughs> this, is, this is a negative LR, uh, Leishmania Brazilianzis. The same thing was done with Leishmania Guayanensis. It worked pretty well for the capsid. Uh, for some clones were, did not work so well for the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, but we still got uh, some LRV negative guayanensis. So now we have not only the tool, we had isogenic lines before, which as, was, as it was said this morning, 
occurred in a, I don't, we don't know exactly how, but anyway, we had very nice tools, but now we have additional tools where we can really remove this LRV. And you can measure really the TNF alpha. For example, this is a knockdown. You can see the knockdown here for either the polymerase of the capsid, and that's f this is done for Brazilian this for TNF alpha or interleukin six. So you can reduce the amount of TNF alpha in interleukin six, and the same for Leishmania guayanensis, where we can reduce now the level of uh, in TNF alpha in interleukin six using RNA I directed against the capsid or the RNA dependent RNA polymerase. So now we have tools to generate. The one thing we cannot do is reinfect this parasite. Uh, taking viral particle or exosomes, I don't know what, but so far we cannot reinfect the strain. A Leishmania goyen in this strain, which does not have the virus, take viral particle, put them in, trying to put them in Leishmania goyen this, we never succeeded to do that. Uh, we don't know why. And I can tell you we tried to have V plus strain just by infection. Um, so the model is now that we have TOLAC receptor 3, and TOLAC receptor 3 can activate different pathways. And I will talk mainly about two of them. So it can activate Cjun kinase, and this Cjun kinase is important for the expression of micro, one microRNA, which is microRNA 155. microRNA 155 is a very common, or not very common, but it's a microRNA which is induced in inflammation. And it also considers as an oncogenic microRNA because in some tumors it was shown that overexpression of microRNA 155 was inducing tumor persistence. And so we were interested to know if TOLAC receptor 3 would induce 155 and if it would have an impact on macrophage. So I skip some of the slides to go because of the time. Um, so what you can see here. So if you infect macrophage with V plus or V minus, here you can see the upregulation of this 155 microRNA. Poly-IC is a norm, it's a control, is an artificial agonist of TOLAC receptor 3, so you can induce 155. V plus induce 155, and it's highly significant uh, towards in comparison to V minus. So we have an upregulation of 155, and does it have a role on the development of the lesion? So we use 155 knockout mice. And uh, what you can see here is if you infect wild type mice versus 155 knockout mice, you have a decrease in the size of the lesion. No effect if the mice have been infected with LRV minus. So effect on the size of the lesion effect on the parasite load. So we have parasite which are by which carry luciferase, so we can follow parasite with luciferin. And so we can measure phot photon per second per centi centimeter square. And uh, we can see that if you remove 155, then you have less parasite in the lesion. And finally, I go quickly because I didn't want to go to all what we did on the regulation, what are the role of 155 and so on. We ended up with one gene which was pretty interesting, which is the phosphorylation of AKT. AKT is a pro-survival kinase, and it has been shown it's like an oncogene, in fact. And what we showed that clearly uh, LRV plus induce a phosphorylation of AKT, and it goes very quickly. And uh, so saying that AKT, phosphorylation of AKT, of this oncogene, is important for the survival of the infected macrophage. So what we are, are observing now is not, it's really an effect on the host cell. So what you have when you activate the like receptor 3, you have Cjun kinase, Cjun kinase MIR 155, microRNA 155, and then you activate a specific pathway and you end up by phosphorylation of the macrophage kinase, which is AKT. And AKT is a pro survival kinase. So it's like if you would transform your cell from a normal macrophage into a tumor in a, in a 
transform macrophage somehow. And uh, so to be sure that really AKT was playing a role, so what we did, we used a specific uh, inhibitor of uh, AKT, or phosphorylation of AKT, which is known and which has been described. So we can go here. This is a full increase in macrophage count. So you can see that you infect. When you infect with V+, plus, you have more macrophage. You survive more. Infected macrophage survive more. When you have toll-like receptor 3, it's decreased. It's what you would expect. And then when you treat now with this inhibitor 2206, MK2206, you can see a decrease from here to here. So clearly, if you block this kinase, macrophage, infected macrophage survive less. Okay. So we have one, part, one arm here, C-joint kinase, microRNA155, phosphorylation of AKT1, and we have survival, more survival in, of infected macrophage. So we are really always working on host, uh, kind, host cell uh, proteins or pathways. But what we know, and I don't have the time to show you this data, we show that 155, not 155 has no role, doesn't play any role on the inflammatory side. So we have no effect of 155 or AKT on the production of TNF-alpha and interleukin-6, so on the inflammation. So there is another arm. The other arm is in production of interferon beta that I mentioned at the beginning. In this case, <coughs> in this case, toll-like receptor 3 induces a phosphorylation of a specific transcription factor, which is IRF3. IRF3 is important for the production of interferon beta. Interferon beta acts on the interferon type 1 receptor, F, and then you have production of TNF-alpha and interleukin-6, and possibly the production of one very important uh, uh, interleukin, interleukin-17, which is involved in chronic inflammation. So just to show again, we did some blood, some Western blood, to show that we have a quick upregulation of IRF3 phosphorylation. You can see it after two hours, it goes up, then it disappears. Okay, so this kind of transcription factor are very quick. You have to measure very early. You see it, it activates interferon beta gene and then disappear in terms of phosphorylation. You see it with V plus, with LRV plus parasite, you don't see it with LRV minus. And uh, to show that this, that interferon beta is important in this V plus infection, in LRV plus infection, we use specific knockout mice, which are FNAR knockout. So these mice do not have the type one receptor. So they can still produce interferon type one, like interferon alpha or beta, but they will not respond because they don't have the receptor uh, for this type one uh, interferon. So what you can see here in wild type mice, this is how the size of the lesion. If you remove the receptor for type one interferon, then you have a decrease in the size of the lesion. This occurs only with V plus parasite. It does not occur with V minus parasite. So we, we know now second arm is important for larger lesion and these lesions are important are dependent, depending on interferon beta or alpha. Parasite load, we measured parasite load, so if you remove the receptor for type 1 interferon, then the number of parasites decrease specifically. So we have now tolac receptor 3, interferon beta, I go a bit quickly, but then we have production of interleukin 6, interleukin 23, and this kind of interleukin acts on Th17 cells. Th17 cells, they produce I interleukin 17A and F. We concentrated after some studies that 17A was important. And this interleukin acts on a series of other ty cell types, T cells, B cells, macrophage, uh, epithelial cells, and so on. And they can act, they, they work and to re 
to increase the inflammatory uh, response. They produce additional pro-inflammatory uh, chemokines and cytokines. They also induce the production of matrix metalloprotease and growth factors. And at the end, <coughs> you could imagine to end up with an hyperinflammation. So, <coughs> in collaboration with um, the Pasteur Institute in French Guyana, and this is the work uh, which we just recently published. Uh, in French Guyana, we had access, or Eliane Bourreau, in fact, did the work in French Guyana. We had access to a series of patients. And in these patients, we measured the amount of interleukin 17A in the, inside the lesion. And we had acute patients and chronic patients, and they were typed either for the presence or the absence of the Schmannia RNA virus to see if they had the virus. So which one had the virus? Acute, chronic, and so on. And we can see that uh, acute patients, um, ac the person who had the virus here had a high level, of the, so it's a black square. The black square, you have more interleukin 17A, that was at the transcript level, uh, that you had more seven, uh, 17A when the virus was present, either in the acute or in the chronic patients. So, we, the, the study was, we, we followed uh, the detail, okay, the acute patients, and we took acute patients because we wanted to avoid the chronic patient could be infected with something else over the time, so we concentrated on the acute patients, and what was observed, here it's the same that what, you, what I showed you before, the patients which had the virus had more interleukin 17A. What was interesting was that this patient had less interferon gamma. So you could see that patient which had RV plus infected with guayanensis plus a virus had less interferon gamma compared to the LRV minus. And so you can make a ratio between interleukin 17A and interferon gamma and you can and relate it to V plus or V minus and you can see that you have a high ratio of 17A versus gamma over gamma in patients with uh, LRV plus. So based on these studies, so it was here when we said, Philip said this morning, research must start in the field, go in the bench, go back in the field. And here, clearly, we started really in the field and with these kind of studies and then set up a mouse model. The mouse model first was really infecting, uh, infecting mice, either wild-type mice or knockout mice for TLR3, so really showing it was related to Leishmania RNA virus. And what you can see that in wild-type mice infected with LRV plus Leishmania goyanensis you have a high level of interleukin 17A which was produced. That's done at the ELISA level, and this is depending on TOLAC receptor 3 as a control. So from that, to show that really IL-17 participate in this lesion swelling and in the parasite load, what we did was, in this case, using mice now which were IL-17 knockout. And what you can see here is wild-type mice infected with V plus versus knockout for IL-17A, and we had a significant decrease in the lesion size. We had less parasite also, the parasite load decreased, so you have here wild-type mice infected with V plus versus uh, uh, IL-17A knockout mice infected with V plus. So we have a decrease in the number of parasites, and you can see it here since we have this uh, luminescent uh, parasite, V plus here, V minus, IL-17A, so you can see clearly it's really uh, strong. However, in this case, we had no metastasis, so we had less lesion, but still didn't see any metastasis. Now, if you just think of the, preli the data I showed you with patients, the patients which had high interleukin 17A, low gamma, so it was clear what we had to do was using gamma knockout mice. Okay, so we, here are wild type mice, and you can see here infected with V plus versus infected with minus. 
uh, LRV minus, and what you, what you observe is when you infect gamma knockout mice, you can see here the footpad lesions start to be big, either with V plus or V minus. This is known, C57, black 6, you remove interferon gamma gene, prof, they explode. However, what we showed, and you can start to see it here, we start to see bumps here, and we started to have lesions, and you can measure by using the luminescence uh, that we have parasites moving from the footpad into the tail. So this is the first model of metastatic leishmaniasis, okay, in the mouse. Then from that, uh, we, you can score the number of metastases. There are sometimes, I have to say, that you, in the gamma knockout, you can have some metastases. It takes a longer time. This normally occurs after eight weeks of infection. We start to see metastases it's between six and eight weeks. And sometimes we have one or two metastases in the V minus. So to be sure to confirm that it was really depending, sorry, really depending on uh, IL-17, what we did, we did a double knockout mice. So we have interphone gamma knockout and interleukin-17 knockout. So you would expect that the lesion develop, but if, if interleukin-17 is important, you should not have metastasis, okay? And that's what you see here. Lesion develops strongly, like a V minus, and you can see the metastatic score so that you have in the gamma knockout, V plus give a strong high number of metastases in the tail and it's extremely reproducible. But if you remove IL-17A gene, then you don't have metastases. So we have now a second arm, which is interphone beta inflammation chronic inflammation with IL-17, and we showed it in a metastatic, uh, mo using a metastatic model, which is an interphone gamma knockout mouse. And just on time, sorry I had to rush a bit, and so this is a group, and the person who did the AKT work is Honor uh, Aaron, the person who did the um, LCMV is Matteo, and uh, we have a strong collaboration with uh, Steve Beverly, collaboration for Totivirus with uh, in, in people in Toscana, and a collaboration with LCMB with Dietmarzen and Daniel Utzenschneider. Thank you very much for your attention.